This is the Canada Podcast. My name is Ram Mahalangam. I am one of the moderators on the Bunger Podcast, and I'm here with Gib Schreffler. Is that the best way of pronouncing it? Am I pronouncing that correctly? Yes, exactly. Gib Schreffler. A noted author who has been on the podcast before to talk about Bhangra and is now here to talk about his new book, Dole, Drummers, Identities, and Modern Punjab. So, Gib, could you give an overview of yourself and what you do currently today? Yeah. Hey, thanks, Ram, and thanks for the Bhangra podcast for welcoming me and all the listeners out there. Um, I'm a professor at Pomona College in Claremont, California. My degree is in... Um, PhD in ethnomusicology. Uh, so I teach classes related to um, anthropology, history, and music, kind of all mashed together, music and culture type ideas. And um, I'm especially interested in, um, as Punjab region on one hand, I'm also interested in historical sailors' work songs. I'm really interested in um, ethnicity as a kind of a cultural issue and uh, identity and nationalism. And um, also uh, really broad questions about kind of what is music and how do people define music? I do, I call myself a musical <laughs> atheist. I don't actually believe music exists. I think it's a cultural construct. So that's a different road we could go down, but that's um, a bit about me. So, Gib, I think for people, you know, who are listening, um, just looking at you and also seeing your name, you are not from India or from Punjab, but you wrote this book and you did a lot of research. How much research and, and hours spent did you put in to write this book? Well, focused on the material in this book, I would say um, it begins with my first trip to Punjab in 2000 and um, returned in 2001. Um, 2002, I think I also returned. These are like a few months at a time. 2003, I brought my then mentor, Grib Das, um, over to, to stay with me for some time in the U.S., then 2004 to 2005, I lived in Punjab for a year. 2006, I go back there again for a few months in the summer. 2007, I bring my Ustad back with me. So there's a lot of going back and forth. And then I um, I had a gap where I wasn't there. I was involved in like just trying to survive in life, <laughs> get a job and get my degree done. And um, meanwhile, always keeping track of what's going on in the Punjabi diaspora. Um then finally, I wanted to revisit all that material from most, almost every year of the 2000s, um, several months in Punjab. I go back in first 2018 to some Punjabi diaspora sites and then 2019 for a couple months, I went back to Punjab to see how things had changed. And that covers an area, um, including both India and Pakistani Punjab from the extreme limits of, of the area. That's awesome. So it's, it's 20 years you spend time back and forth with gaps in Punjab, researching about the dole. So why dole? What brought you to the instrument and what made you so passionate about the instrument and its players? The interest in dole initially, and which is somewhat different than what I ended up with in this book now, 20 years later, but the interest there was um, just visiting Punjab, wondering if I could... Um, possibly contribute some insight through a research on Punjabi music. At that point, there were a uh, few, few books on Punjabi music. The books that we did have were basically, basically about songs mm -hmm. and they would um, tend to list the text of songs that someone had documented, typically a, a, a local Punjabi author and maybe give some commentary on like, well, this is what the song means. Let me explain it to you based on the words. Um, there wasn't in terms of like what you would call folk music, at least there wasn't real many, um, studies that focus on the sound of the music and there, there wasn't anything on, on rhythm. And, um, I, as humbly as possible, I, I sought to fill that gap in a way thinking, well, I had, um, musical, um, training in my background. I had some sense I could make of rhythm and I could probably, um, contribute um, more to talking about the sound and rhythm than I could to 
uh, the text of Punjabi language songs, of course, the native speakers of that are going to be the experts on interpreting those meanings. And there was one other piece to this, which was that um, I, since the, I noticed that the to players were from specific social groups that tended to be marginalized, they tended to be of a lower social class regarded as than others, um, than say the people who would become scholars and professors in Punjab. Right. That there was a bit of a barrier in, in knowledge and interaction between those two groups. Whereas my outsider position in a funny way, although I was disadvantaged by being a foreigner, there was some privilege there and being able to interact with those individuals with less of a barrier there. So I, I hoped that I could fill a gap with that. And that's what brought me first to, um, Dole and, and seeing it as, as sort of at the center of a lot of things that were happening at that time. But as I said, that's, um, a bit different than, um, what interests me in Dole nowadays. <laughs> One of the key kind of linchpins of the book is your relationship with your mentor, Garib Das. Could you talk me through and, and walk me through how that relationship started um, and how it grew into something that really became the backbone of the items that you talked about in this book? Sure. I met Garib Das in 2000 on my first visit. He was um, accompanying a dance coach named... Nurinder Nindi, who was, um, who's well known in the Chandigarh area, um, as a stage Bhangra dancer, as a trainer and so on and so forth, a coach. And Garib Das came as the accompanist. Um, but the, those two had worked together for a long time. And like many of us tend to do, I, I wanted to learn it. So I just set about trying to ingratiate myself with, with the Ustad. And, um, that, that was not easy at first. There was some skepticism about that. Um, I feel like it took a while to prove my good intentions, which I, I think should have been the case. And I think is usually the case with the new stad. And of course, the barrier there to get over was a lot of the material that I talk about in my book. The fact that the Tolu stads, they, they have no reason to teach any outsiders of their community, no desire to do so, generally speaking. So why would they be interested in talking to me? And I think what eventually happened was that, um, Garib Das, very smart guy. And he saw that I had some sensitivity to listening to him and potentially um, could mediate some of his messages, could be a bit of an ambassador, could translate some of his ideas and give some recognition to his values and to his community. Um, whereas, as I interpreted, others wouldn't do that because they'd either take things for granted or gloss over what he was saying or, or sort of translate his ideas into their own agenda or something like that. So we developed this, this mutual relationship, this friendship where um, he was felt really inspired to teach me not only Dole, but his, his values and about Punjabi culture generally, and um, just nurture my development in that and then hope that I would pass on that knowledge to, to other people with the privileges that I have as an, as a writer. And, and you talked about how you wanted to learn and, and that's how the relationship with someone like Garib started. Uh, but you also mentioned that's not what you wrote about and that's not what this book mm -hmm. is about. So what drove you mm -hmm. to write this book? Yeah, this is the big question for me, uh, Ram. Picture my um, status as an outsider to Punjabi culture. And I'm noticing over all these, these couple of decades, there's a lot of discourse on Punjabi identity. There's a lot of explicit uh, kind of presentation of Punjabi identity. I don't think you have that everywhere in South Asia or everywhere in India, let's say, that every person from every region is just like talking so much about, well, we're Punjabi, this is the Punjabi identity, right? And um, I think if you're, if you're soaking in that, you're the fish swimming in that water, you might take that for granted. That's on the table already and you think, well, our, our matter to discuss is, you know, what is um, more or less Punjabi identity, these sort of things. You're not really asking, like, why are Punjabis talking about identity so much? Why is it sort of so important right. to them? And if I put, take from my position, I'm thinking, well, I, I'm, I come from the United States. Like, do I know people who are, like, talking about how they're American all the time or how they're or I'm from New England, part of America. We're not like New Englanders, like, yeah, New Englanders all the time, wherever we go. So this was like years of kind of this weird and wonderful world of Punjabi identity, viewing this as an outsider. 
And then starting to see, as I, this connects to what I said earlier about how my interest in Bill changed over the years, because it wasn't so much this way at the beginning, that time in the turn of the 21st century, but Toll became more and more embroiled in these articulations, these presentations of um, specifically Punjabi identity. And when I say Punjabi identity, I don't mean it's just, well, Grib Das is someone who happens to be from Punjab. You cannot call him Punjabi. He has some sort of identity. Therefore, it's Punjabi identity. I'm talking about some um, uh, bigger construct, which I refer to as um, Punjabi cultural nationalism. So I got really interested in how I uh, got sucked into Punjabi, what I'm calling nationalism. I know that sounds like a scary term, but we can break that down. What I mean by that, it gets sucked into that as a, as a symbol. Whereas, as I saw it from, through this pers- perspective of Dolis, it had not been a generalized Punjabi right. symbol before. It was more the symbol of those, uh, the identity marker of those specific individuals. Talk a little bit about that change that you saw and, and that shift from Dol being a an instrument that supported a lot of activities and an instrument that now supported this sense of identity. Sure. I mean, um, in the, the, the history that we know of the last, you know, few hundred years up until very recently, um, gold playing was a service profession. There are individuals who are professionals. They provide it as a service where when it was needed for certain cultural functions, um, and those functions would include things like playing for individuals to feel the spirit and, and go into a trance at a shrine, or to make an announcement about something, or to create an atmosphere of um, excitement at a sporting match, or of course to co- accompany the the dances, the group dances, or to um, you know, announce the entrance of the, of course, of the brat, of the, the groom com- party coming at a wedding. And one could also say, you know, they would add some auspiciousness to the occasion by being like the correct thing in the correct space at the correct time happening. Where, where we get a shift is um, after after independence, where wherein mostly Pangara, but then other folk dances as well, uh, become taken up as these nationalistic pursuits. And where now there's a, a call for these dual playing professionals to accompany these groups as well. So there, there's an added layer at that time to the work of those professionals to now also provide the representation of the nation through these, um, through these dances. And that becomes so lucrative for some of them, not for all of them, but for some of them, um, that actually gives them a huge step up economically. Um, to be employed in that sort of activity, that um, some of them start to focus more on that that side of the the profession. And um, what we get little by little is, um, I call it, you know, like putting all your eggs in one basket. You might focus on one type of work to the detriment of others. So you you know that's the, the kind of work that's going to make you the money. So you focus on that and you kind of ignore other parts of the tradition. But someone like Grib Das, who um, was born in 1939, um, became by the 70s one of the leading um, dole players for the the national and international Bhangra uh, events. He straddled both of those worlds. You know, he still remembered all the, the old functions and the new representational functions that these show pieces for um, national identity. And it's really um, his generation, I think, did that. And his generation around about like, 2010, around that, around that turning point, you see all of them had either um, passed away or they had retired that generation. And by that time, we're starting to, to see more of a um, shift to just, um, well, dolis that don't focus on those traditional functions except for the dance accompaniment and f- moving into new areas, which is accompanying music, as you'd call it. Because dole by itself is not music per se, but playing along dole to, to popular music. And for you, it's, it seems like it's an existential question at times throughout the book. But what does it mean to be a Doli and a, and a player of Dole? And how has that definition evolved? Yeah. In my book, I distinguish it between Doli and Dole player. That's not a real distinction. I just, it helps you keep straight what I'm talking about. 
When I'm talking about dolis, I'm talking about people who belong. They're connected in a way. Like, I, I just had the thought, thinking of like connected, like you're part of a the mafia or something in an organization <laughs> like that, a connected person, right? Um, you are, you know, it's like clear who is a connected man and who sort of isn't. And the dole player could just, uh, I use it to, to just refer to anybody who happens to play the instrument, but who's not connected in that way. To be connected means to be part of a dole playing community. It's really a group effort that you're engaged in with the other members of your community for the economic survival of that community. And there's, there's a number of them, say maybe a dozen of them and maybe about four or five that are the real prominent ones where they, they specialize in dole. So to, to grow up in that community is to have the option of possibly playing dole and fulfilling that role as that kind of, um, service provider in that community, then the rest of your community wants to nurture your development in that. So you can earn for that community. So it's a really big issue here because this is your inheritance that is one of the few things you have that others don't right. do and can help you to survive. And if you sell that, I, I compare it to the idea of like Jut saying it's a sin to sell their, their land. And you talked a little bit about this concept of Punjab nationalism. And you mention in the book its impact on these communities and the impact of their Dolly versus the Dole player. Could you break down what you mean by this question of Punjab nationalism? The idea of Punjabi cultural nationalism that I'm talking about um, is a phenomenon that relates in part to travel to the movement of Punjabis in the world. I think when if you look at um, Punjabis that you interact with outside of Punjab, you will, or at least I have found more um, concern about Punjabi identity and more reflection on that. This is arguably a um, a law of the universe of culture. When you leave the area that you're a part of, all of a sudden you you recognize who you were, so you you think about it more. Whereas when you're in that area, you take it for granted. Um, so these conversations, uh, we are from Punjab, or what even what is Punjab, um, happen much more in spaces outside of Punjab or in spaces within Punjab amongst people that are kind of urbanites or cosmopolitans that are connected with that sort of global scene. Contrasted with people that you'd find locally in Punjab who, when they're kind of conceiving themselves, their identity, they're thinking, oh, I'm the brother of so-and-so, or this is my caste. Or I'm from, uh, you're from Maja, I'm from Malwa, right? Um, I'm a really good Doli, you know, something like that is more front and center at their identity. So the idea of Punjabi nationalism um, is a type of cultural nationalism. When I talk about nation, I'm not talking about a, a state. I'm not talking about a sovereign state, a government that has its borders and rules over its people with certain laws. I'm talking about the old idea of nation as a people, a super ethnic group, um, a bunch of people that believe they're connected somehow as a group of people. And in order to hold together that idea that we're connected, even though we're, we don't know each other necessarily, right. we need some points of connection and we don't have a state to do that. There is no Punjab country. So how, what are those markers? How do you connect? Well, you connect through a certain selected cultural markers of what you believe to be the essential earmarks of what is being Punjabi. So the danger there is that once you've made that construct, somebody has selected what those markers are of what's being Punjabi. And they've constructed something where there's a kind of a core, which is a more Punjabi and a less Punjabi. You have more of the center and there's sort of a border. There's a more typical central like Punjabi subject, somebody who somehow represents more the core essence of Punjabi and people who don't. And the question is like, who is doing that, making that selection? Who is involved in this discourse of sort of producing the idea of what those markers are that makes you be Punjabi? And does that leave out certain other people, disenfranchise them from inclusion in that Punjabi nation? Yeah. And if you, and you, and you look at who is most involved in that discourse, there's certain privileged actors, higher economic classes, people with more mobility, people who have more voice in society historically who are doing that. So they're constructing the idea of Punjab 
on their own model and their own vision. And the people who are doing that are not the Tolis, for instance. Mm -hmm. So it brings me to wonder where do the Tolis fit in their, their culture, their identity into this larger construct. And if Tol was something that they were the innovators of and the creators of and the sole, absolutely sole caretakers of for hundreds of years. Now, what's up with this people that are engaged in this, this other Punjabi nationalistic identity construct? What's up with them? taking the Dole as a symbol to represent them. It's surprising where Dolis come from. Talk to me a little bit about how has one traditionally come to be a, a Doli in Punjab? Mm -hmm. I, I know I said Dole wasn't music, but some related auxiliary paramusical things like that um, has been limited to, limited to people of certain ethnic groups. When I say ethnic groups, um, I'm referring to what you might call castes, or which I prefer to use the Punjabi word and call calm. Mm -hmm. So a specific calm. Um, the performance of music has been limited to them. This is, does not include singing because singing unaccompanied is, doesn't quite fulfill all the criteria for what is, what is music. There's been something for a long time, something uh, dubious about musical performance, something that um, in a way, lowers the status of the performer in the, in the eyes of others in society, such that there's only certain people in society, it seems to, to one, that um, can absorb that right. kind of stigma. So the lowest caste are going to ab absorb that, and without other options of things to do, they absorb that. So we have these different communities, um, and they tend to be clustered in different areas in different parts of the Punjab. They tend to specialize in certain markets. They tend not to interact with each other very much. They're, they're little like subcultural worlds in themselves to a certain extent, where some, totally from one calm doesn't necessarily know what the practices are in another calm because they're just in their own world there. Margins. Yeah. And, and you talk a little bit. I think in, in the last chapter about your retrospective as you come back to India in 2019, what has the impact of that identity had on those Doli communities and how have they evolved or not evolved in the face of this identity coming up? There's two ways that I approach that. I talk about the existential um, aspect of that word, there's a crisis of identity of the Tolis, whereas where, what has happened to our um, like spiritual morale in this kind of situation, and that's linked to what they have been compelled to do in economic terms. I would liken it to a sort of like economic um, neoliberalism, and, and I really like to compare, um, to, to ask people to consider um, Think of the empathy that you have for Punjab's farmers and how the neoliberal economic system and the Green Revolution put them in the situation that they're in, right? This the crisis that they're in. And it was led to all these tragedies like the uptick in suicides and so forth and the bankruptcy of farmers. Um, that Because somebody is interested, the, the Republic of in India is interested in, in exploiting the labor of these farmers and getting their products for cheap and so on and so forth and sort of appropriating that as part of their nation. It has something similar to that happen to the, the labor and the property of the Tolis. And so the Tolis, they can't really on their own get out of the situation where um, they, as I said, they need to follow the money. Yeah. Okay. They're, they're struggling. So if the opportunity comes up, where um, the most lucrative thing to do is to play in service of these these representations of nationalism, then that's what they're going to do. That's where they're going to focus their efforts. And they know they've little by little in this creeping way they have to sell out some of their the values which gave them their pride and their morale and their very specific identity. And so we're at the point now where. Um, Maybe the younger generation of a professional Tholi looks at the elders and like, "Hey, old man, this is what I, this is what I got to do. This is this is what I'm going to do. You try to teach me about what the pride of being a Tholi." Um, whereas, meanwhile, of course, the elders are inclined to to say, "Well, that's really good. You're making money, but bef 
but what we we have money now, but we we don't have the same pride that we used to. Have. As this cultural change has happened in the background, in terms of music and in terms of identity, what in your mind makes up what is an ustad? How do you classify or quantify an ustad? To be an ustad amongst tolis, I think, has a different meaning than perhaps in other contexts. For example, in uh, Hindustani classical music context, it's not essential to learn from an ustad to be a professional toli because one gains one's knowledge and their, most of their training on how to play generally through just growing up in the community. And so by the time they might hook up with an ustad, become a disciple, they pretty much know what they, they need to know in terms of the professional practical aspect of it. At that point, getting a new style, there's almost like more of a formality. It's like, I liken it to like just getting married. If you're, you're South Asian, it's pretty typical culturally to expect you, you get married. Your parents are like just waiting for it to happen. <laughs> and then yeah. finally, after your marriage happens, they can rest easy. They can retire and live to, into old age. What does the Ustad do then? They're not really teaching so much you how to play. They're more conveying the values of their community to you. Or just serving as that person who is allowing you to be um, connected. They're regulating all of the um, the activities and the values in the whole community. And that's why we use the word ustad and we don't use the word teacher. There's also this relationship that's being formed that's connecting the, the two members of the community is um, a, re- a relationship of responsibility on both mm-hmm. sides. Getting an ustad is signing a contract as the student that you've committed yourself to these values. You've committed yourself to being a a servant of the greater good of your community and um, following all the the customs and all those sort of things. And then being an ustad is like, I agree in a way like an adoptive parent to adopt this person and take them under my wing and be the absolute role model for them and walk on the straight and narrow. Yeah, and it it seemed to me that an ustad was less musical as as it was an ideal. But you are signing up to be an ideal, to be an ustad versus actually graduating with some degree of skill. Even though ustads are obviously very skilled at playing the dole, it's more here are a list Mm -hmm. of ideals and this is what I'm going to represent and this is how I'm going to do those things on a day-to-day basis. Is that a fair statement? Yeah, I think so. I think so. And I think um, saying it that way takes the emphasis off um, like the technicalities or, or the practicalities of playing the instrument and producing music and puts the emphasis, like I said, more on the relationship that's there. And this is why um, most Ustads um, have been very reticent to teach outsiders because it doesn't make sense. Why would you teach your this this art to someone with your actual purpose is, as an ustad is to form this connection within your community? What purpose does it serve to have someone outside of your community? They're not going to feed back into your system. They're not going to give back to your community. They might continue your art if you think that your art was the focus, but the fact that they don't do that, I think, you know, speaks well to how it's not really the transmission of an art. It doesn't work like um, like granas in Hindustani classical music where I belong to this school of an artistic tradition. Yeah. You did talk about Lal Singh Bhatti in the book and you talked about how he em- was one of the first ustads to emigrate into the United States. And for a really long time, he was the only ustad and he was one of the first people to actually teach and package up lessons. And ustads are not like that. And you speak a lot about ustads are not really technical teachers of the arts. They're very different. What does that look like? So there's no system among the tolis traditionally for giving music lessons. Um, I would observe Sigribas, his grandchildren, from the youngest age, just Walking into the room, seeing a toll there, tapping on it. Yeah. And he would praise them. And um, they had heard these patterns from birth. And they would they didn't quite have the ability necessarily to put them in meter, like to put them in time. Anything from Gurib Das 
it was like, okay, Ustaji, can you show me how to play this? And it'd be like, play the thing full speed. And I'd be like, what was that? Uh, can you do that again? Do it again. Okay, uh, can you slow that down? No, I don't slow that down. It's, if you, if I'm teaching you a language, I don't say, this is the language. <laughs> slow down my voice. <laughs> I just go, you want, you, you want to know how to say this word book? Book, say it. There it is, book, say it. But the bigger issue is that um, the idea of just giving a lesson went against the Ustad's system because um, the lessons are like a commodity that you give to someone. Yeah. And what should you get in exchange for a lesson? Someone can give you money in exchange for a lesson. Or they could try to make it like they're not giving you money, give you a gift of some other sort or just do you a favor or something like that. It comes still comes down to what looks to be like some kind of economic exchange right. that's happening for lessons. And that's the thing that they don't want to sully their their practice with that type of exchange. That goes against that the whole purpose of like why you are a disciple, that it's nurturing. That was like one of the stress points where where doing that would be like something where certain tolis would do that and other tolis might kind of like silently shame them, like, well, what are you doing there? Whereas the dolly who's doing that would then rationalize, well, I'm just doing it on the side for some extra cash or some extra prestige. So once we move from like the doll moves from Punjab itself to the diaspora where you don't have dolis that can, can nurture a community, it, it necess- necessitates a, a complete change in the system of transmission. And that, I think that was like the real stress point that Happens happened around the turn of the century and it has changed the face of everything. One of the interesting passages that you write about is how Garib Das, he riffs a little bit with, I think it was with Damal, and he adds his own flair. And my question is, does Nustad teach you how to play Damal? Or does it seems like Nustad more teaches you how to understand and judge the moment of where you are and play to the audience or play to the specific stage that you're on. I think that's fair. I didn't learn how to play tamal from Grib Das. Or if I did, it was like, I, I said, please, please, Ustaji, let me, let me just video this for a second. And then I took the video home and watched the video over and over and analyzed it to figure out how to play it. Um, but yeah, there, they teaches you what's appropriate. This is a word I use in the book a lot. Like what's culturally appropriate right. to be doing with the tool, which could be what's culturally appropriate to play or it could be like what's culturally appropriate, like where you stand. The tool is not the center of, of attention. You don't stand in the middle of it. You don't, I mean, you see like young players in the diaspora seem like they like to, to roll up their sleeves like they're showing off their <laughs> biceps or something. Like, look how powerful I am. I'm the big man with the dole. Uh, I'm so masculine the way I do this sort of thing. No, the traditional dole is like, no, no, no. I am the service provider. I'm the companist. I fulfill my role. I'm off on the side. So that kind of uh, appropriateness is in there. And one of the big things with Garib Das was all about the difference between what you might consider the folk style of Dole versus versus other styles. Yeah, and it's fascinating too because you talked about Ustad Ravidana, who I actually have seen perform live mm. at a Bangara, Bangara competition as well as recorded videos. Yeah, he's amazing. And amazing. he does not play, I think, in a very archetypal Ludbi or Bangara style of playing Dole. He does not. And there's a certain sense of him thoughtfully, almost thinking with his dole, like the inventiveness of how he plays, which seemingly is a mark between and someone who an estad who's a dole and an actual person who plays dole. And I and I'm mm-hmm. I'm wondering, is that something that came up a lot? Which is this idea of not only what's appropriate, but when to inspire some invention and when to stay true to what is folk. Mm. Yeah. I think that's the, um, the difference um, between the Desi style, which we could translate as folk. We could call it the Desi style um, and the more artistic style. Um, 
do is dole meant to um is the playing of dole meant to create some effect in the space that you're in and transmit a message or is it meant as a sound that someone creates that others should listen to and appreciate as the sound that it is these are like the kind of the, maybe two poles of a spectrum and I, and the latter what i said sound that someone creates that's meant to be listened to others for specific appreciation of that sound that's that's how i define art art music um and different poems of tolis lean one way or another mm-hmm. the community uh, that ravidana belongs to they are more at the extreme end of the spectrum of artistic playing whereas gribdas who belongs to the bazigar community they're totally at the other extreme the desi playing where it's let's not muddle what we're doing we're sending you a message and i've said i've made an analogy like this before like if i'm sending an sos to someone with a morse code right. with some message tapping da 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 i'm going to tap that message exactly i'm not going to do any little extra flourishes on that because you need to understand loud and clear specifically what that message is so gribas would if i wanted to play some tiraka to tiraka you know extra things he would say what what are you doing there no no don't focus on that focus on cleanly playing and and stylistically appropriately the main message um type of thing um but ravidana's community they um they're jogis they um the jogi community we think is some transformation of older marasi communities in the past like their ancestors would have been called marasis um although they aren't right now um and they had their hand in a much broader high of artistic performance on lots of different sort of instruments and more leaning towards that kind of artistic creation so they weren't always in, in that function in that sort of village folk function i've always when ravidana played it was very eye opening for me because i i came from a very folk bongara style of listening like it was very much you play a specific way for a specific thing and it was eye opening to see someone play a dol like this in a very what i would consider now as after reading your book is it's traditional and it's non traditional at the same time the other thing i wanted to mention to pick up an earlier thread is that i think um framing your performance as art or as having artistic value is a strategy for upliftment and i'm talking about social upliftment and for um gaining prestige which might be relevant to you now um before i explain that a little further in the the contrasting scenario in the case of grib das yep his social mobility was actually dependent on him sticking to the folk stuff because he was um gained such success professionally as an accompanist for folk dances that the dancers wanted him the dancers didn't want you to play dole in this like artistic way where everyone's listening to the dole and everyone's confused by like complex patterns they wanted the desi style so they could dance to so they preferred the way he played so his his career depended on that sort of emphasis and he gained prestige in that realm as the very concept of folk gained some prestige which it didn't before independence there was no prestige of being folk it was some that folk essence is there and then that gains prestige but on the other side if you were just a just quote unquote a service provider and you don't you're not an artist well that that relegates you to the ranks of service providers and there's no prestige there and service pro- provision of services is associated with the the lower social economic groups so how do you uplift yourself from that how can you get prestige and distinguish yourself or how might you remove some of the stigma associated with being engaged in those types of activities right. well wow, there's this concept of art that's more of a idealistic romantic idea of art an abstract art not belonging to like culture per se like not bounded by the web of society that says there are high and low people now that sort of thing it's this uh, aut- idea of artistic autonomy and if you can tap into that that can be a way to raise your prestige and that is precisely what a lot of the tools in Pakistan especially uh have done in the last few decades where 
in India, this is a, a really fascinating thing I discovered in contrasting Pakistan and India and how they've developed separately mm-hmm. in their building communities since partition. Whereas in India, the the flavor of uh, identity or nationalism there privileges the folk identity. So you can gain prestige, you can get value, uh, be viewed as valuable by other people if you tap into the folkness. But in Pakistan, you don't gain a lot by presenting yourself as folk. You still look, quote unquote, backwards of a low level. So Tolis there in order to raise their status in, in a veil of economic opportunities do not front themselves as folk players. They front themselves as artists or artistes who are able to handle like classical musical figures. Right. And therefore they present it as like they're, they're elevating the tradition. Yeah, and, it's, and you talk a lot about how partition really segmented musicality. Dol was the music of the region, but it wasn't tied to something that was culturally relevant as it was in what is present day Pakistan. And that's come through folk dances, which I find mm. fascinating, but it's also part of the reason why we have this podcast because oh. that's what it's been tied to Bhangra and, and it's been the sound of Bhangra ever since. Um, the folk dances, Bhangra would just been the vehicle that for, for this whole new understanding and opening up the spaces and, if you will, creating the market for a lot of different kinds of music and little spaces where it wasn't there before. Yeah. So this might be a, a very, might be a big question, might be a small question, but Gib, if I were to take one thing, new thing away from this book, what would you hope for me to take away as a reader? Um, I would like people to think about um, a more inclusive idea of what it means to be Punjabi to think about which voices are they not hearing? Why might they not be hearing those voices? And um, that's, that's my message for people who are like soaking in the ivory liquid of Punjabi identity 24 seven. There's other people too that are around the corner from you in Punjab that maybe you didn't, when you go back and visit your bend or something, you don't meet them, but they have a totally different perspective on things. But but they're in your village too, and they're like Punjabis just as much, you know, according to being from that region. But they have a very different life experience and perspective. That would be one sort of message for more of a general public. Um, I'm interested in rethinking the idea of uh, cultural appropriation and blasting open some of those discussions that I think tread on the same tracks each time. There is some element of appropriation that went on with Dole amongst Punjabis. And I saw today, just on Instagram today, I saw this, um, uh, one of the Dole suppliers in Jalandhar who's, who's supplying these Doles to people in the diaspora. And they've carved a Dole custom order for someone. And they've carved into it, it says, Tima Jut on one side. And the other side, it has like a Kanda and like a couple automatic rifles. And I'm seeing that. I'm like, what the heck is this? It's, what is the logic to this? Why don't we talk about that in terms of cultural appropriation? Is it, be, is it because we just like gloss all those people as brown and you say like a brown person appropriated something from another brown person that doesn't count or something? Yeah. And many times I think when people do cry cultural appropriation about things in our popular American culture, they're crying wolf a little bit. They are overstating the case of cultural appropriation. They're there's not really an injury there. There's sort of an imagined hurt that's going on. I see that counter argument sometimes. But in this case, the injury is there too. Because that this act slowly, slowly through attrition has diminished the economic for these dolis. So that, that is an actual felt injury that's happening to them. So I just ask people to just think about their actions a little bit. Why might it be inappropriate to slap the word jut? like your ethnic group on a dole, whereas like dolis are like for hundreds and hundreds of years, they've been the diametrical opposite of Jut in Punjabi society. Like why is that all of a sudden claimed as a Jut thing? Yeah, that's good to know. And I, it is definitely something that I learned a lot about in this book. So for those folks listening, is dole 
Drummers, Identities, and a Modern Punjab. It's by our really good friend of the podcast, Gib Schreffler. Gib, I appreciate the time. I know you got to move on to sea shanties, but I'm really glad that you could at least make the time for Dole a little bit before you start right down that. Thank you for listening to another episode of the Bungarda Podcast. Be sure to follow us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. Please help us out by rating and reviewing us on Apple Podcasts and Podchaser, as that really helps others find the podcast. Also, don't forget to follow us on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, all of them at the Bungarda Pod. If you want to know what else is going on in the podcast world, sign up for our newsletter and join our Discord server to get exclusive content you won't get anywhere else. There will be links to all of those in the show notes.